Welcome to another show of this week. Our first story wraps a visit of the United Nations Security Council to South Sudan. During their trip, the Transitional Government of National Unity agreed to allow the deployment of a regional protection force as per a UN Security Council resolution passed on August 12th. The announcement on the deployment came late on Sunday, September 4th, in a joint communique issued after a meeting between President Salva Kiir and Ambassador from the UN Security Council's 15 member states. Cabinet Affairs Minister Martin Elia Lomro read out the communique to the press. To improve the security situation, the Transitional Government of National Unity gave its consent to the deployment as part of UNIMIS of the Regional Protection Force recently authorized by the United Nations Security Council Resolution 2304. So what we need to do now is move from these really important high-level commitments into working out the modalities in an operational way. Uh, and again, the UN Security Council was very clear on what, what is needed and what is sought, and the government was very receptive uh, to sitting down, and we just need to do that in a very urgent way uh, because, of course, uh, as everyone knows, uh, the population is vulnerable in, in different parts of this country. Before their closed-door meeting, council members were shown around the presidency by President Kiir so that they could view damage caused by the clashes in early July. Earlier in the day, council members visited WOW where they met with displaced people and had a chance to speak to them. But please know that we feel your fear and we hear your suffering. We know how much you have suffered. It is true that we are not able to go uh, to see your homes, many of which have been destroyed, uh, but we believe you. Uh, you know best about what is happening uh, to your families. Unrest around WOW has resulted in repeated displacement of more than 78,500 people. This includes 39,800 internally displaced people currently sheltering at various locations in WOW town. We have come as the UN Security Council to try to determine how we can strengthen UNMIS, how we can push the government and other parties to implement the peace agreement, and how we can secure accountability for the horrible crimes that have been committed here and around the country. And so the U.S. permanent representative to the United Nations stressed the need to operationalize the commitments made in the communique. Addressing a news conference later in the night, Ambassador Samantha Power said there is an urgent need to remove all obstructions to UNMIS operations and emphasized the need for cooperation. The challenge now is to ensure that a piece of paper uh, becomes operationalized, that the RPF deploys, that the consultations over modalities, uh, which have been happening already, but now need to pick up pace and steam, uh, that those uh, bear fruit, that the AU comes and presents its proposals on the hybrid court, and that that gets uh, operationalized, given the number of atrocities that are being uh, carried out, uh, that the peace agreement be is implemented, notwithstanding the rocky road it has been on, and that the SRSG and the force commander see and the humanitarians who put their lives at risk to try to support the people of South Sudan see concrete progress when it comes to lifting the obstruction on unmissed movement and lifting the restrictions on humanitarian access. The delegation left early on Monday, hopefully that the weekend visit will bear fruits. We have relationships, I think, with various government actors that we hope to be able to build upon. I think there was a lot of mistrust between the Security Council uh, and the 
government of uh, national unity, the transitional government, and uh, we have the UN General Assembly coming up where a, a large South Sudanese delegation is going to be coming to New York. I think we will, I certainly personally will see uh, if we can build upon the conversations we've had here, make sure that there has been follow through for what has been um, committed to uh, last night and hope that we have a new partnership. Uh, we've seen very real challenges, um, both in terms of the um, divisions in the country, um, the huge challenges for IDPs um, and the huge challenges that UNMISS faces. We did, however, also have um, some very honest discussions with the government of South Sudan um, and the statement that they released last night, which has now been endorsed by the Security Council, um, is a very important statement because it shows a real desire to tackle some of the issues that we raised. Uh, composition, generation and deployment takes time. But as you read again in the communique, by the end of se September, things uh, must get uh, moving on. And you see in the resolution creating the force, authorizing the creation of the force, the, the, the force will be deployed until end of December. We have observed that uh, the South Sudan is a rich country, rich in means that, that they have a, a big a big land and fertile and uh, they have a, a quite a uh, big potentiality of development. Uh, but unfortunately, with this political uh, uh, problem, uh, th those uh, development is totally stopped and so suspended. So uh, I, I think that uh, uh, South Sudan would work together with the international community to develop their country. That, that, that is the most important thing to, to, to see. With the council members leaving, their visit will hopefully be seen as a commitment to seeing an end of violence in South Sudan by UN member states. In our next story, we interview Festus Morai, the Joint Monitoring and Evaluation Commission Chairman, who welcomed the recent visit of the United Nations Security Council. For the United Nations Security Council to come and see for, them, for themselves and interact with some of the very important players here was a, very, was a step forward. Because, as you know, or you may not know, we are required as JMF to produce a quarterly report to the same report to the government itself, the transitional government of national unity, the heads of state uh, triggered, heads of state summit, the peace and security council of the African Union, and the peace and the security council of the United Nations itself. And so since they are the highest world body to whom we are accountable, to whom we report, for them to have come here and exchange the ideas with the government is one of the best things that has happened from our point of view. I think that the government has been assured, for instance, that the international community is in partnership with the government and people of South Sudan for the implementation of the peace agreement and that, that the envisaged um, protection force is, is nothing else but what it says. A protection force, protection of civilians and everybody here, including key institutions that are important to the nation and to everybody here. But there were serious misgivings on the part of the government because they felt that this was an, an evasion force which was going to violate their, um, their sovereignty. And we endeavoured to explain as much as possible that that was not the case because it was said that they are going to work collaboratively with the government. They are going to, in their protection of civilians in and around Juba, they will be working in collaboration with the government in protecting the, air, the airport, for instance. 
the government will still be in control. The government will still decide whether they allow me into South Sudan or not. Anybody else. Uh, the government will still be able to stop South Sudanese living through the airport, as they have done before. They will still be able to do that. What the protection force is, will be here for, will be to ensure planes are not shorted when they are landing or taking off, and that the airport control mechanism, you know, flight control, is not uh, disturbed, it's working, so that um, aviation, civil aviation, is safe for everybody. But they will be doing that with, uh, the, with, the, with the government. And therefore, it is envisioned they are working together, because they will be protecting access for everybody into South Sudan. People who are allowed, not those who are not allowed. For instance, the protection itself will not come if the South Sudanese government says, no, 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 no. It would not come. But if it is here, those people who are allowed to go out, they will go. Those to come in, they will come in. But they will be safe because the, the airport will be guarded to make sure that no, no animals, no other people run around the uh, runways, either in, in, out of ignorance and innocence or, or out of um, evil intent. Everybody regret, of, of course, that the people of South Sudan, the leaders of South Sudan, have been fighting among and between themselves for so long. And the death toll has been so heart rendering. I would want to say to the people of South Sudan, that as evidenced by the visit of the Security Council of the United Nations, the international community are determined to bring peace to South Sudan. The international community are a partner with the people and government and all the people of, of South Sudan and all the political parties of South Sudan. Everybody is anxious for this country to find peace so that you can begin to address the normal challenges of development of a developing country, which they are. And that therefore, that is why we fail, but we don't give up. The international community is not prepared to give up because they are convinced that peace can be brought about. You have lived together sometime in the past. You can do it again. It is within the competence of the leaders of South Sudan to agree to work together, to compromise. Compromise means give and take. In other words, between me and you, you, got, you don't get everything you want and I get nothing. Or I get everything I want and you don't get that. You get some of the things you want and I get some of the things I want. That's what compromise is about, when there are two parties. And unfortunately, the leadership in the country have not shown enough of that flexibility to date. But we hope uh, they will, they will. Our priority right now is to hold a workshop on the issues. This has been, been mandated by the United Nations Security Council. The people to meet are we, JMAC, the UN mission here, IGAD, and CITISAM, and the representatives of the two parties. We intend to do that on the 21st and 22nd of this month. This week, as we commemorate the International Literacy Day, which is marked annually on September 8th, we will do things a little different. We pay tribute to a 49-year-old mother and student. Through photographs, we decided to pull out. These images have been snapped by our own photographer, Isaac Billy. South Sudan's early July conflict left thousands displaced, among them a 49-year-old mother of four, 
called Teresa Adwog Deng. It was 50 years ago, just before 49-year-old Teresa was born, that the International Literacy Day was proclaimed with an aim of promoting literacy as a tool to empower individuals, communities, and societies. It is only now, five decades later, that Teresa has been able to take advantage of her current situation, where she is seeking refuge from conflict in her country and has been able to enroll at a makeshift school at the United Nations transit site which is hosting displaced people. Teresa has joined other displaced children who include her own, both in class and also on the playground. With South Sudan's literacy levels being one of the lowest in the world, and with the calls for universal literacy, it is hoped that adults' literacy levels in South Sudan, which currently stand at 27%, will improve. And with progress having been made towards improving literacy levels worldwide, the United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon says the world is still far from achieving universal literacy. But with sustainable development goals still being pursued, Goal 4 is aimed at ensuring that all young people achieve literacy and numeracy, and that a substantial proportion of adults, like Teresa, who lack these skills, are given the opportunity to acquire them. The new United Nations Special Envoy for Sudan and South Sudan is in the country to meet with various interlocutors. Nicholas Haysom takes over from Haley Mancarius and he spoke to Radio Mirai's Philip Wani. Here is the interview. My mandate was created at a time in which uh, the relations between South Sudan and Khartoum had plummeted to uh, a very dangerous position. Uh, since then, uh, I and my predecessor, uh, SRSG Haile Mankarius, have been engaged uh, with both governments to promote not only the cooperation between North and South, that is a positive collaboration, and also equally to discourage negative actions which can uh, disadvantage other country. Commitments have already been made by South Sudan towards uh, promoting peace and security in the region uh, more generally, but particularly in regard to collaboration with uh, Khartoum. In Khartoum, I candidly share that there were some complaints of lack of uh, delivery on the commitments which had been made here. Um, and we followed that up uh, with the various ministers. We were told uh, that there had been a very constructive meeting between the two governments in Khartoum some two weeks ago and that uh, there have been a real commitments made around collaborating on oil related matters, uh, transitional financial arrangements, on a redeployment of troops to create a buffer zone, uh, potentially the introduction of joint police patrols uh, and other areas which would also help South Sudan overcome a very difficult predicament, economic predicament that it faces at the moment, including corridors, uh, trade corridors between North and South. And you know, when one is trying to deal with North-South relations, I think one has to recognize that the internal situation in the South or the internal situation in the North has a dramatic impact on the capacity of both countries to interact positively. Uh, we know already there are mutual accusations that each country negatively uh, interferes in each other's internal affairs, principally by supporting uh, insurgent groups. And uh, so to the extent that in each country there are robust and sustainable peace processes. It also removes from the situation a source of tension between the two countries. South Sudan and to some extent North Sudan are poised on very dramatic uh, moments in each country's uh, 
history. And if they make the right decisions, then both countries and the region will come out considerably strengthened. And if they make the wrong decisions, then I think we will live with the consequences for some time to come. For our Voices of Peace this week, we spoke to some members of the United Nations Security Council. We will end our show with their voices. Goodbye for now, and remember to join us again next week. Let them believe in themselves. Let them work with their government. Let them uh, for, forget about tribal divide. This country is so rich, so blessed uh, by nature. Uh, it can become one of the giant of the Africa, feeding Africa and exporting and contributing to the country's development. The calling uh, for peace has to be one kind of felt in the hearts of the leadership, and uh, there has to be more accountability for injustice, or it's going to be hard to get the people to trust that peace is possible. So ensuring that the government follows through on its commitments, deepening the relationship, working in a spirit of partnership with the South Sudanese people, um, hopefully will set, set things on its course. The main message is that international community is together with you. But uh, first thing is that uh, you should stop uh, fighting am among you, that it is now the time to get together uh, for the uh, nation building. Be very clear about what you need from your government. Um, secondly, um, to really um, unify as a country. There are huge tribal and ethnic divisions in this country. Um, and what this country needs, the newest country in the world, is unity. Um, that is the most important thing.